Manhattan, which is actually part three of a three-part series uh, where we've been discussing managing complex option portfolios. But before we do get started or underway here today, I'd always like to begin each session with a quick audio check. So notice on the right-hand side of your screen, there happens to be a questions panel. If you would, please um, activate that panel um, or open it up where you can add a Y or a yes. That lets me know that we are indeed connected and ready to get underway here today. Okay, um, <clears throat> let me see. Ah, oh, excellent. Thank you, Bala. Uh, do appreciate that. I always hesitate until we get that response. Um, so with that, what I'm going to do right now is actually leave this on my disclosure slides while I get my recording equipment started and we'll go ahead and get underway here today. Uh, excellent. Well, hello everyone, Cynthia Tomain here with Interactive Brokers, and thank you for joining me for today's webinar, where we'll be discussing managing complex option portfolios. Today in part three, um, Rajiv Bora is going to be reviewing simplifying the option Greek. Um, so with that, I'm going to actually move this right over. Let me pass the controls over to Rajib, um, <clears throat> who is going to be discussing uh, moving from individual option risk to portfolio risk and analyzing multiple underlying portfolios. He'll also be reviewing um, building scenario management tools for analyzing your complex portfolios and some managing some additional sources of risk, such as dividend or stock borrowing risk. So with that, let me uh, pass my controls right over to Rajiv. Rajiv, if you would go ahead, um, let me make sure I can, uh, oh, here we have it. I'm going to go ahead and make you the presenter. So if you would, share your desktop, and we'll go ahead and get underway today. Thanks for joining us, Rajiv. Yeah, thanks a lot, uh, Cynthia, for the wonderful introduction. So, hello and welcome, everyone. So, today is uh, the third uh, part of the uh, series uh, on managing complex options. So, Cynthia has very nicely introduced the uh, various uh, uh, portions of today's uh, webinar. So, the first part that we'll start with is moving from individual option risk to portfolio risk. So we had already seen, let me use a whiteboard for this. We had already seen how to uh, look at uh, Greeks of an individual option. So we had seen how the delta or the vega or the gamma of a Greek changes from uh, you know, uh, based on difference in market conditions. So we already know how the deltas behave. We already know how the gammas behave, we already know how the vegas behave, we already know how the thetas behave. So let me <coughs> now uh, take a portfolio and uh, uh, we will try to look at uh, certain scenarios and then you, you would now appreciate how uh, the sessions of the, the last few sessions uh, suddenly uh, uh, make things very easy in analyzing a huge portfolio. Say you have a portfolio of this type wherein you have underlying trading at, this is, these are the different strike prices, 63.5, 63.75, 64, 64.25, 64.25, 64.75, 65.25, 65.25, 65.25, 65.75, and then you have the calls, and then you have the puts, so say this is how your portfolio looks like. You are short 100 calls. You are long 200 puts. You are long 200 calls. You are short 100 puts on the 63.75. And then uh, you are short 300 calls. You are long 400 puts. You are short 400 calls calls, you are long 500 puts, and uh, you are short 200 calls, you are long 200 puts, and you are long 200 calls, and then you are short 300 puts on 64.75, you are short 300 calls, 
long 200 puts, short 400 calls, long 300 puts, long 300 calls, short 400 puts, minus 100, plus 100. So if you look at this portfolio, you have positions in <coughs> 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10. 10 call options. Your positions in 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10. 10 put options. So you have positions in 10 call options. You have positions in 10 put options. And then say to hedge yourself, uh, you had taken positions in the future. So to say the future was trading at 64.5, you were short 100 uh, lots of futures at 64.5. So what does this mean? Basically you are holding a portfolio which has positions in 21 different instruments. How do you analyze this portfolio very quickly? How do you say uh, <coughs> where your risks lie? How do you say that whether um, movement of the market is good for you, whether increase in volatility is good for you, whether passage of time, uh, whether uh, time is good for you or uh, absence of time is good for you, whether increase in volatility is good for you. How do you make such decisions very quickly? Okay, so let, let me give you one hypothetical scenario. Say it's uh, the market closes at 5 p.m. Uh, every day, so it's 4.55 p.m. on a Friday evening and then the trader looked at his, his portfolio and then he saw that his portfolio had a Say hypothetically, it had a net positive delta of uh, plus 100. So he hedged himself by selling 100 futures. And uh, on Monday, the market opened up at uh, say 64.6. In which case, uh, 64.4. In which case, he seems to have made a huge loss. Now, why did this happen? The trader had hedged himself properly on Friday. His portfolio delta was zero. Now on Monday, when the uh, on Monday when the markets opened uh, slightly 0.1 points below, uh, the portfolio was uh, in the red. And so why did this happen? Which of the various, uh, now, okay, there is one more uh, condition that I will add. Monday also happens to be the expiration day. So the trader hedged himself properly on Friday. His net portfolio delta was zero on Monday when the market opened, it opened slightly uh, weak and then uh, uh, when he opened his uh, trading account, he saw that his trading account had a uh, bit of a negative uh, PNL, uh, had uh, suffered some losses. So why did this happen? So which of the various uh, uh, characteristics of Greeks that we had learned so far should we apply here? Remember the trader hedged himself on Friday, but uh, what he hedged himself on Friday would not be hedged on Monday because uh, uh, some things have changed. Most importantly, the time to expiration has changed. Now, because the time to expiration has changed, uh, what he had delta hedged on Friday will not be delta hedged on Monday, especially because on Friday there were three days to expiration and on Monday there is just the, it's just the day of expiration. Now, you could always use hugely complex uh, technical tools, uh, 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 tools available on the internet and then calculate what your portfolio delta would look like on Monday uh, and therefore you could hedge yourselves that way. Uh, you could basically uh, do a lot of scenario analysis, uh, use all scenario analysis tools and then calculate what your hypothetical delta would be on a future date, uh, on a hypothetical date in the future. but Today I'm going to show you how you can just looking at these numbers, you can very quickly say whether you are going to get positive or negative deltas which time. So looking at this portfolio, I can very easily say that you are going to get positive uh, deltas which time. How, uh, 
anyone has any guess uh, uh, how this portfolio got positive deltas which time? Okay, so let me very quickly get to that. If you are long a call option, in the money call option, you get your delta increases with time. Re remember that uh, from our first uh, webinar? Because if you're in a long and in the money call, uh, the delta of a call is the probability of the option ending in the money. Now as you go closer and closer towards expiration, the probability of the option ending in the money increases. Therefore, in the money call, the delta increases with time as you go closer and clo closer towards expiration. What happens to out of the money calls? Out of the money calls, the delta decreases with time. What happens to in the money puts? In the money puts, the <coughs> probability of the put ending in the money increases, therefore the uh, delta of the put would approach minus one. Uh, so while it increases, but then it increases with a negative sign, so it actually decreases. Uh, it goes from 0 to minus 1, so therefore while it increases uh, in absolute terms, but then uh, uh, numerically it decreases. And out of the money puts, the delta decreases, but then because puts have a negative sign, therefore uh, it, numerically, it increases. Now, what do you see here? If this is the current strike price, which was 64.5, anything above this, like 63, 63.5, and so on and so forth, if you hold long positions, if you are long in the money call, or if you are long out of the money put, your portfolio delta increases with time. And then anything which is on the upside, which is 64.5, 65, and so on and so forth, if you are long out of the money calls or if you are long in the money pulls, your portfolio delta decreases with time. Now going back to the previous slide, this is what existed. I, I made it too extreme. So here, the net position on 63.5 is 200 puts long, 100 calls short for a net position of plus 100. So you are 100 straddles long here. You are 100 straddles long here. You are 100 straddles long here. 100 straddles long here. Zero. Short 100 straddles. 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 So basically, you are long on the upside because of which you got positive deltas with time. If you were long on the upside, you would have become, you would have gotten negative deltas with time, but then because you are short, therefore you would get more positive deltas with time. Therefore, the cumulative, cumulative effect of both is that you would get more and more positive deltas with time. Now, let me <coughs> explain that. Uh, now, obviously, a lot of you should have a question. Why, how did I end up the position in the put and the position in the call and then arrive at a net position for, for a strike? Why did I do that? Uh, obviously, if I add the call and the put, then the total number of data points that I have to look uh, at has reduced from 21 to 11 now. So how, how, why did I add up the position in the call and the position in the put? Okay. So if it's a delta hedged portfolio, what do you do, do to a call to make it delta hedged? You sell the underlying. So this is the, this is the call and this is the underlying that you have sold. What happens when you sell, hedge by selling the underlying? This is the net, net resultant position that you have when you bought a call. Now likewise, when you bought a put, this is the put that you have bought. 
So this is the put that you have bought. You hedge yourself by buying a future. The net resultant is this. Basically, whether you bought a call or you bought a put, both of them are equivalent. It's equivalent to holding long straddles at that strike. So, so if it's a delta hedge portfolio, you uh, when you buy an option and hedge it, it becomes a straddle at that point. Therefore, no, uh, because both the call and the put becomes a straddle at that point. The, the call has become a straddle. The put on hedging has also become a straddle. So therefore, both the call and the put are equivalent. Because both the call and the put are equivalent, so what I've done is I've added the positions in the call and the put and arrived at the net straddle positions on each of the strikes. So by arriving at the net straddle positions for each of the strikes, so this is the net straddle position for this strike. This is the net straddle position for this strike. This is the net straddle position for this strike. So what I've achieved is the net straddle positions for each of the strikes. And then now I've, I could very easily say that I'm long on the downside and short on the upside. There is another very be beautiful and easy way to look at it. I'm not sure if all of you are able to follow this. So the next beautiful way to look at it is the underlying was a 64.5. And we had long straddles at 63.5, 63.75, blah, 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 and all of them. And we were short straddles here. What does it mean? If you're long a straddle at a certain strike, what, what would you want the market to, how would you want the market to behave? If you're long a straddle at a certain strike, you would want the market to move as far away from the strike. So if you, for example, if you are long a straddle at 100, the payout is highest as you move as far away from 100 on either direction. So at 110, the payout is 10 minus the initial straddle price that you pay and so on. So you would want the market to end as far away from 100. But what happens in case you are short a straddle? In case you are short a straddle, you would want the market to close. You would want the market to close at the strike price because this is where the payout is maximum. As you go far, further away, the payout reduces and in fact becomes negative beyond a certain point. Now. From this previous diagram, well, from this previous positions, we see that we had massive long short straddles on the downside. We had short straddles on the upside, which means that this is how the payout of the portfolio was like. The payout because of positions in 63.5 was like this. The payout because of positions in 63.75 was like this. The payout because of positions in 64 was like this, and so on and so forth. Now the net payout of the portfolio is the sum of the payout because of positions in 63.5 call and put, the positions in 63.75 call and put, 64 call and put, and so on and so forth. So basically, you extend all of this in all directions. You take the summation. So your payout at, say, 64.5 is the summation of this value plus 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 this value, which is a negative value, plus this value, and so on. So what we see here is the optimal place where you would want the market to end would be something around here. So somewhere around here. There would be a precise pop spot actually. So which means you would want the market to go up. You would want the market to go up. Now delta 
would also change in the direction you would want the market to move. Therefore, this portfolio has positive delta. The change in delta with time is positive. So this is another very quick way. So basically, the first step to simplifying an option portfolio is to not look at calls and puts separately, but just add the calls and put positions to arrive at the net straddle position for each of those strikes. Once you arrive at the net straddle position for each of those strikes, the rest of the everything else becomes much more simpler. You just have to look at the net straddle position per position uh, strike and then analysis becomes so much more easier. So if you have, you, you would say that, hey, I'm massively long straddle this strike, I'm short straddle the rest of the strikes and I'm massively short straddle this strike. So you would want the market to move towards this side, but then that leaves you with an exposure, right? So what if the market order moves in this direction? You know, if the market order moves in this direction, then you'd make some losses. So therefore, what you would do is you have to probably sell futures and so on, so, so that your exposure uh, on the downside is uh, reduced. Now, all along we have discussed how do you look, uh, just add up the straddles. So you said that, hey, uh, I'm 100 long, 100 calls long on this strike and then 200 pulls long, so I'm giving me a net 300 straddles. And then uh, I'm 20 calls short and then 80 puts short, giving me a net 80 straddle short on the other strike. Now, if you are not delta hedged yourself, if you are just traded in options, you need to add the resultant delta of the position. So if the market is currently at this point, and then you had not delta hedged yourself, so uh, this simplification assumes that every call is hedged with a future, every put is hedged with a future, because it's hedged, therefore the, uh, a call can be looked at as a straddle, a put can be looked at as a straddle, if it's actually not hedged, so assume it's hedged, draw the straddles, and then the leftover deltas, just add them up. So if it was not hedged, and then uh, the unhedged is equivalent to uh, 500 futures uh, short, then uh, long, then just uh, short, then just add this uh, uh, future to uh, position to the graph. So you, in this way, you could very quickly uh, arrive at the uh, resultant payout from having hugely complex option po positions, which are spread across strikes, wherein you have positions in call, puts, and everything. And then uh, you have very, just by looking at them as straddles, you have reduced the complexity in one swift go. Okay. So th there are other ways of simplifying uh, uh, option position analysis, uh, but uh, because we are, uh, we have the paucity of time, we'll have to very quickly move to the next uh, uh, topic. So this was just to give you an inkling uh, as to what are the various things possible. Uh, and uh, uh, one way of looking at portfolios and simplifying them. Okay. <coughs> the next topic is, uh, say you have positions in, so the first top point was when you had positions in not just one option, but multiple options in the same portfolio. So that was point number one. The second thing that we're going to look at today is say you have positions in not just one portfolio, options of one portfolio, but options of multiple portfolio. How do you do that? Say you have options in Coca-Cola, and then you have you own options in Coca-Cola. You option own options in Pepsi-Cola. Now you are long uh, volatility in options in Pepsi-Cola, and then you are short of uh, uh, volatility in options in Coca-Cola. So, at a broad level, is a news in the uh, soft drink market any regulation in the soft drink market which is going to introduce volatility? good for your portfolio or bad for your portfolio? How do you very quickly arrive at the decision that uh, whether uh, at a broad level, combining your positions in uh, options in multiple underlyings 
uh, is um, the portfolio uh, is the exposure of the portfolio to volatility to time to underlying price move broader market movement uh, uh, how is it impacted so let us look at that okay to be able to uh, understand how portfolios containing options are uh, combined let us first look at how do people combine portfolios with non options so delta 1 products so products like stocks or uh, futures so these are products which only have a delta exposure and they don't and then and then they don't have an exposure in volatility cheetah uh, interest rate and so on so delta 1 products are products whose prices are only uh, are only exposed to the market direction so um, these are products like futures stocks etc now if you are creating a spread between two uh, futures or two stocks say you are buying a stock and then you are selling another stock and then you are making a bet on the relative price movement between both of them so how do you do that you basically uh, buy a certain uh, value of stock one and then you sell a certain value of stock two to keep yourself uh, uh, if you are making a bet on the relative price change between A and B you said it relatively to B A is going to do well uh, but uh, but then you don't want to make a bet on the direction of the market in, in that case what do you do you, the total value of stock A that you buy and then the total value of stock B that you sell you will have the same value on both sides so if you say that Coca-Cola is going to relatively outperform Pepsi Cola but then I don't know in which direction the market is going to move so if you buy 1 million dollars of Coca-Cola you are going to sell 1 million dollars of Pepsi Cola that's it an equal value on both sides okay uh, you could also probably give weightages to volatility of each of them and so on so what you typically do is you uh, equate the dollar delta of your positions on both sides what is the dollar delta of positions on both sides the dollar delta of positions on both sides is uh, the dollar delta is the change in value for one person change in price of the underlying if the how much will the portfolio value change if there is a one percentage change in the price of the underlying so that is the dollar delta so for one percent change in the price of coca-cola uh, uh, how much should your portfolio value change for one percent change of price in pepsi cola how much should your portfolio value change uh, if you uh, equate the dollar delta on both sides your portfolio is balanced now similarly if you are doing the same thing through options what will you do what you need to do is you need to ensure that the change in option value because of one percent price change in the underlying is the same for on both sides so what is the change in option value for one percent change in the price of the underlying you need to use the delta of the option so not only do you have underlying dollar delta which is this equation but you also have the option delta so when you do that you can create spreads so you said that hey I think relatively uh, between Pepsi and uh, uh, Coca-Cola and I think both of them are going to have the same kind of volatility but I think Pepsi is going to outperform uh, Coca-Cola in which case uh, the amount of call options that you buy in Pepsi and the amount of call options that you sell in Coca-Cola you you can adjust it this way now obviously when you do that you would also want to calculate what is the option dollar gamma option dollar vega and so on now but then is just calculating option dollar delta this way the right thing to do or uh, we haven't accounted for the fact that certain stocks could have higher volatility uh, could have the characteristic of having higher volatility and uh, then uh, other stocks in which case your exposure is not just to price change but then is also to the volatility of, of those stocks if you adjust for them this is what you get volatility collect corrected dollar delta the volatility corrected dollar delta is therefore 
the underlying dollar delta multiplied by the option delta, which therefore this part gives you how much will the option price change for one percentage change in the underlying. But one percentage change in instrument one is more likely than one percentage change in instrument two because the volatility of instrument one is more uh, higher than volatility of instrument two. So therefore what you do is you calculate the volatility corrected option dollar delta which is option dollar delta multiplied by uh, the ratio of volatilities of the two instruments which therefore gives you a volatility at, uh, uh, corrected. Uh, so both the sides, the long option and then the short option, both of them now have the equal probability of uh, uh, the, the value at uh, the value at risk on both sides is, gets equated. So if you do that, what you get is your positions in instrument one and the positions in instrument two. Uh, you could now make a uh, bet on the relative movement of prices of both of them. So if you do that, if you continue in this version, what you get is you can uh, actually calculate the total dollar delta of the option portfolio. You have positions in instrument one. Till here, we were only discussing how do we have a spread, wherein you hold options in instrument one, you hold options in instrument two. How do you have a spread where both the sides are uh, matched? But then, say you do hold a position in which both the sides are not matched. So all you need to do is you need to just uh, add the do option dollar deltas. You need to add the option dollar vegas and you get the total portfolio dollar gamma, total portfolio dollar vega, total portfolio dollar delta and all the other grades which uh, remember this when you are calculating the total dollar gamma everything is now adjusted or the base is the volatility of uh, instrument one. So basically, if you hold positions in five different instruments, the total dollar gamma that you see is equivalent to uh, to, the, to uh, a single portfolio, which has instruments only in instrument one. So say you have positions in instrument one, instrument two, instrument three, and so on. You calculate the dollar gamma for the portfolio con uh, of instrument one, instrument two, instrument three, and so on uh, from this formula. So the total dollar gamma that you see, uh, uh, how do you make sense of that? That is equal to the dollar, uh, to a portfolio just in instrument one, which has the equivalent gamma. So what does, what does it mean? You have, uh, op you own options in Facebook with a gamma of, 1000, you own uh, options in Google with gamma of 500, you own options in Microsoft with gamma of 700. Now using this formula, you can actually calculate the dollar gamma based Facebook, which means if you add all of them up, and uh, uh, you get a value of uh, which instrument one is equal to Facebook in this e equation, then the dollar gamma that you get, sorry, is equivalent to a portfolio just in Facebook with a gamma of say 2000. So if you use that formula and calculate uh, and get a value of 2000, what does 2000 signify? It signifies that the port combined portfolio is equivalent to just what a portfolio in only Facebook with a gamma of 2000. So now what you have done is you have reduced the complexity significantly. So instead of looking at portfolios in instrument one, or gammas, so instead of saying that, hey, this is how my portfolio looks like. So let me just uh, put it down. So instead of saying that, hey, my Facebook portfolio has a delta, vega, gamma, theta of x, y, z, 
a uh, google has uh, x2 y2 z2 a2 and then some of the, these are say negative values and how do you say that what is your net exposure vega wise are you positive vega or are you negative vega how do you do that so all you need to do is using the formulas that we have seen we can calculate the dollar total dollar gamma total dollar vega and so on and so forth using one of them as the base which is the first instrument when you do that you can sum them up and then you can say that hey my total dollar gamma total dollar vega total dollar theta total dollar delta base facebook is this much so instead of looking at 12 different values you can just look at one two three four different values life becomes so much more easier okay so that completes the second part of uh, today's webinar okay so let's uh, look at the third part of today's webinar which is basically if you hold complex positions how do you very quickly uh, make sense of what your risks are like say you have positions of this passion how do you very quickly say that how will the portfolio value look like if the price goes up if volatility goes up uh, as you are closer towards expiry and so on and so forth. So there are various tools that exist uh, exist on the internet uh, and are provided by vendors and the vendors will probably not like it when I show it now but uh, um, most of those tools are very simple products and then you don't uh, have to spend exorbitant sums of money just to build those tools, just to get those tools. You could have very well procure, you know, build those tools in-house yourself, uh, uh, yourself. So today what we will do is we will very quickly look at how do you build uh, such tools uh, uh, yourself. So it's actually a very simple thing to do. Looking at the total exposure. So all you need to do, you need to calculate the PNL for each and every uh, instrument and then you have to sum up the PNL for all the for your positions in all the instruments and that gives you a total portfolio PNL. So if you are trading and then you want to calculate what is your PNL at expiry, how do you do that? If you if you have bought a call, then the uh, value of a call is either how much in the money it is, or if it's uh, out of the money, it's going to be what zero. So if it's in the money, the moneyness is the value. If it's out of the money, the value is zero. The PNL for a position in any instrument is going to be the position that you hold multiplied by the value on expiry minus the value at which you initially bought it. So what I'm going to do is I'm just going to drag the equation and So this is what we have. So at various prices of the underlying, the 500 lots of the call option that you had, which you bought for 114.15, will result in a in the following values of PNL for you. Will re, pro, contribute following. PNLs to your portfolio. Likewise, for the 5,000 lots of sold call options that you had at this strike, for various eventual values of the underlying on expiration, it will result in various PNLs at various price points. Likewise, you could do the same thing for puts. I have not done it no, in this example. So you could do that. So 
let's look at how the PNL at expiration looks like. So for, for the position that you created, this is how the PNL at expiration looks like. And uh, this is because you are massively short most of the places. And so on. Okay. So you could do that. So creating a PNL at expiration is such a simplified tool. So you don't have to actually go to, uh, and buy such tools from vendors. But then are you in would most of you be interested only uh, in knowing what your PNL and expiration would look like. Obviously, knowing what your PNL and expiration looks like is a is a great thing to have because if you know that this is how uh, your PNL expiration looks like, so you know that you can sleep peacefully because this is the maximum loss that you can ever have, and uh, you know that if the market goes up, uh, this is what uh, and ends at a certain value on expiration. This is what you would make if the market stays uh, at a certain point. So you you know precisely how much your portfolio is worth on, at various levels of the underlying on different dates. So you, because you know that, you have peace of mind. But uh, do you want to do that? You want to do that, but what else would you want to know? You would want to know how your PNL would look like on a, uh, on a particular scenario date for various scenario volatilities, for example. So uh, I'll just do one example. So what we, what I've done is, so there is this uh, macro, that, sorry, uh, function that exists which just calculates the price of a call option. So given the price of the underlying the exercise price, the time, interest rate, volatility, and dividend. Now what I've done is the, oops, sorry. Call option, underlying price. The underlying price is uh, this uh, scenario price, uh, A4, which is uh, the exercise price, is uh, the strike price. The time is the scenario, scenario time. So how much time is left on the scenario there? So which is if this is the scenario date, so the time to expiry in terms of date becomes this much and uh, express in terms of uh, uh, days to, uh, in terms of number of days, uh, number, amount of year becomes this much. So this is the time to expire in terms of dates, time to expiry in terms of years. So we have that. So this is the time to expiration. Then we have uh, uh, interest rate, which is taken as zero because this is the future. Uh, then you have the volatility, which is the volatility of the instrument on the on today's date. So you can always play with those. So in these graphs, I have played with the volatilities on uh, scenario date. So once you do that, mm, so this part gives you the price of the option on the scenario date for a given value of the underlying, scenario value of the underlying. And then you could also change the, so here we have just changed the date, which is, we said that, okay, what would the uh, portfolio value look like on the 21st? Today is the 19th, we said that how will it look like on the 21st? And uh, at various prices of the underlay. So on 21st, if the underlay, so what does it mean? On 21st, if the underlying were to reach nine. 1450, how will the portfolio value look like? And if the underlying were to reach uh, 9650, how would, would the portfolio value look like? And so on. So for various values of the, uh, for various values of the underlying on, the tw if the underlying were to end up at various values on the 21st, how would my portfolio value look like? So this is what you are more interested in, right? So this graph here, therefore shows, how would your portfolio value be on the 21st if the underlying were to end at various levels? You can just change this figure here and then you can say, hey, if it's instead of 21st, I want to know how it would look like on the 20th or on the 22nd. So you just change this input and 
voila, you have your graph which says how your ex portfolio value would change. So, um, so you now have more control in, in, instead of knowing what will happen on expiration day, you now know what would happen on any date. So you now know how what would happen on 22nd, you would know how what would happen on by the evening of the 22nd, and so on and so forth. So you have uh, you have so much more control. Okay. Now next thing is this graph tells you how your portfolio would look like at uh, various uh, underlying levels on a particular scenario date. But you would want to be able to explain why your graph looks like this. One thing is knowing that this is going to be a payout on expiration, knowing that this is going to be a payout if you close your position on a particular scenario there for various values of the underlying. But how do you explain why you have this graph? So to be able to explain, all you need to do is calculate how your delta, gamma, they got surfaces look like. So what did I do here? I calculated the gamma of the call option that we had. So strike price is equal to uh, prices of the underlying is equal to 9450, strike price is 9350. Uh, time to expiry is uh, from the uh, worksheet called current position, uh, interest rate is zero, uh, then what is the volatility? So volatility is uh, from uh, this graph, uh, this worksheet, and I did some uh, announcement uh, uh, multiplier to uh, various volatilities. I said that if the market were to really go down, that volatilities will go up, and then if the market were to go up, volatilities will, would go up, and something of that sort. So I did that. So therefore, whatever was the volatility today, I did an uh, adjustment based on where the market ends up. So this is the implied volatility on the scenario date. This is uh, the, uh, what is the last field? If I'm calculating gamma, dividend. So dividend is zero. So if I do that, this part of the equation gives me the gamma on a scenario date for a given value of the underlying, which is G2, this one, for a given value of volatility, which is this one, and so on. So using this formula, you get a scenario value, scenario gamma. So gamma on a scenario date. You do that for all the options and uh, this is the gamma of a single instrument but then obviously you're interested in the gamma of your portfolio which is if you hold 500 lots it's basically 500 into the gamma of one option. If you hold minus 5000 it's minus 5000 into gamma of a single instrument. So if you do that you get the gamma surface of your portfolio. Likewise, you could complete everything now. What this does is it calculates the delta of one option for a scenario date and scenario volatility and multiplies that by the uh, delta, uh, multiplies by that by the number of options that you own. So which gives you uh, delta of the portfolio and then if you sum this up with the position in the future. So you get the delta of the portfolio on scenario date. Likewise, you could do it for Vega and Theta. Theta once again, position that you hold in the option multiplied by the Vega of the uh, So the theta surface would tell you how much money would you make every day if the underlying were to stay at a particular level. So it says that 
if the underlying were to stay at this level, uh, for every day that, that you hold your position, you are going to make this much money every day. For every day that you are holding your position, if the underlying were to reach at this price, you are going to lose this much money. Obviously, uh, all of you have uh, already understood it uh, that theta, all the Greeks do not stay constant with time. So you, you can't say that you are going to lose this much money every day because the amount of money that you lose on the next day is going to be more than this. Uh, and then the money that you lose on the subsequent day is going to be even more than this. So um, that is the second derivative. You could, instead of using the formula for theta here, you could use the formula for the derivative of theta with regards to time and then you would get uh, the rate of change. So that is there. Okay. So in this way, without going to the market and buying uh, egg, expensive pieces of software which you don't know how to integrate with your trading tools, what you could do is you could just download your trading positions and then once you download your trading positions, you could just load them into a, a, a spreadsheet tool like this and then uh, you are nice and good. So once you, uh, you, you could just download your positions from say interactive brokers and then you can upload it to an Excel of this format and then you know all your risks, where your delta is, uh, how your delta surface is, uh, uh, if the underlying reaches a certain point, how much positive delta will you get, how much negative delta will you get, how will the delta of the portfolio look like if the underlying reaches, uh, underlying is at a certain value and so on and so forth. So you don't have to go to the market to uh, buy software tools which give you all the scenario analytical uh, scenario analysis uh, uh, which gives you all those uh, uh, PNL values of various scenarios. What they do is they implement exactly uh, a version of this and uh, you could very well do it in-house uh, by implementing a, an Excel of this format. So it, it's a very Excel, simplified Excel so uh, I, I would expect most of you to be able to be uh, to do it yourself uh, uh, so yeah okay the next part how do you manage additional sources of risk like dividend and stock borrowing risk oh oops. I don't know why the slides are getting shifted automatically sorry for that so when you when you have a stock which pays dividends what do you do uh, if you're holding a, an option? If you have a call option, what do you do? Well, if you own an, uh, own the stock, what happens when you when there is a dividend? The person who has the stock gets the dividend in his, in his bank account the stock price drops by an amount equal to the dividend amount. So let me use the whiteboard once again. So if the stock is trading at 105 and at T0, at T1 dividend is paid, say a dividend equal to 5. So the stock price now becomes 100 because the value cannot be created out of thin air. So if 105 was the value of the stock before dividend, if a dividend of 5 is paid out and this goes to the stockholder, then the value of the stock will become 100. The, this is simple and easy to understand. But what happens to someone who owns call options? with a strike of say 105. Now, because the price of the stock has dropped to 100, the likelihood of the underlying ending above 105 has reduced and therefore the value of the call option will diminish. Because the price of the call option will diminish and the price of the put option will increase, 
Therefore, someone who has bought call options will not, so, so therefore people will not be as interested in buying call options if there is a dividend involved. Now, in the Black-Scholes formula, <coughs> you could <coughs> put uh, the value of dividends and then the price of the call option and the put option will get adjusted aut automatically. You don't have to do anything actually. <coughs> So just input the value of dividends in the black scholes Martin formula and then uh, uh, in the Martin uh, formula and then you'll get the value of the options. However, life is not as simple as it seems. If the underlying is trading at 1000 and then you are trading options which expire three years from now <coughs> and at 1000 it pays a 5% dividend annualized, which is 50. Do you expect them to be <coughs> still prepaying a dividend of 5% if the underlying were to end up at 100, 800? How much dividend do you expect if the market were to, if it were to end up at 900? If it were to drop to 800, you think that they, you know, there's the likelihood of them being paying a dividend of 5% is much lesser. So probably you expect them to pay only 3% dividends. Here you expect them to pay a dividend of 4%. Here you expect them to pay a dividend of 5%, 5%. And here you think that probably they might pay slightly higher dividends. So this, <coughs> when you price options, various options uh, at different strike prices, the, you don't use the same value of dividend to price all the options. You use so you you use various no uh, various values of dividend at various strike prices. So when you do that, this, this concept is known as Q dividends. You don't expect the same value of dividend uh, at different prices of, of the underlying. So when you trade options which are longer dated, where the uncertainty related to the dividend amount that is going to be paid out is high, then you don't use the same value of dividend throughout. And uh, the fact that you use dividends which are skewed uh, is known as, this concept is known as skewed dividends. Okay. The last point in today's lecture is about stock borrowing risks. <coughs> Sorry. If you are a market maker, for example, or if you are a trader and you have bought call options, how do you hedge yourself when you bought call, call options on a stock? You hedge yourself by selling stocks. When you buy put options, you hedge yourself by buying stocks. But then if you don't own the stocks, if you don't own the stocks, <coughs> how can you sell stocks? You will have to borrow the stocks. If you have to borrow the stocks, <coughs> you would be less inclined to buy call options. Likewise, you would be less inclined to sell put options. There are two ways in which you can handle this. You could make a small adjustment to the price of the underline so that you are uh, small negative adjustment to the price of the underline so that you are less likely to buy a call option and then you are less likely to sell a put option 
so that you are skewed. You, know, you price your put options cheaper, and then you price your uh, so the price your call options cheaper, and then you price your sell option and put options higher. If you do that, the likelihood of uh, buying a call option and therefore being forced to uh, sell the stock to hedge yourself reduces. So basically, say you, you you want to trade a viewpoint on volatility. If you want to trade a viewpoint on volatility, you uh, if you want if you have a positive viewpoint on volatility, which means that you feel that the volatility is going to uh, implied volatility of options is going to go up, or uh, realized volatility is going to go up. If your viewpoint on the volatility is positive, then you buy options. Now, when you buy options, you could either buy call, call options and uh, sell stocks and have a long straddle or you could buy put options and then you could buy the stock and you, you could have a straddle. Now if you buy call options to express a viewpoint on volatility uh, and to express a viewpoint on volatility you can't have a naked call option you have to convert this call option into a straddle by selling the stocks. So if you buy call options and sell the stocks you, you have to borrow stocks to sell, sell them. In which case, you have to pay the stock lending and borrowing rate. So, therefore, uh, if you want to express a viewpoint on volatility, you know, by buying a straddle, throw calls and puts and stocks, you would be more biased towards buying a put and buying a stock. So, therefore, there are two ways. One is a small adjustment in the price of the underlay. Another one is by introducing fake dividends into the uh, into your pricing formula. So your fake dividend would, therefore, what happens when there is a dividend? The price of the call option drops, the price of the put option increases. Therefore, when you introduce a fake dividend, uh, you could, you would be less biased towards buying call options and uh, less by biased towards selling put options. So you could do, introduce fake dividends. Uh, uh, you could introduce fake dividends to handle stock lending and borrowing rate related risks. So if you don't want to uh, end up with huge uh, short stock positions and then therefore you don't want to be exposed to changes in stock borrowing and uh, lending rates. So in that case what you would do is you would introduce fake dividends into the pricing of options. Okay. So with that we've completed the topics that we had set out initially for today's session. So I believe uh, I've just uh, overshot by a few minutes, couple of minutes, but given the fact that uh, we had tried to uh, put a lot of topics in one webinar, so I think uh, I am pretty much pleased with uh, the short overshoot that we have done. So any questions that you guys have? Okay, so there is one question. Can you please elaborate on using second order Greeks, Charm, Vana, Veta, and Voma to effectively manage portfolio risk? Okay, so remember the thing that we had discussed known as Charm. So today's example that we did at the start of the class, the very first example that we did today, that was nothing but Charm. This example was nothing but Charm. So here, the delta which was hedged on Friday was not is not hedged on Monday morning and that is because delta has changed with time and how did delta change with time? Delta changed with time because of a concept known as chart. So likewise the rest of the Greeks so if you want if you know that what is the second order derivative of Vega which regards to volatility or Vega which regards to time then you could use it in various scenarios like the following. Say, uh, the Fed chairman is uh, supposed to make an announcement on interest rate uh, hike or uh, rate cut or so on. So he, you, you expect the Fed, Fed chairman to make an announcement and uh, therefore you know that post the announcement the volatility is going to drop down drastically. If post the announcement the volatility is going to drop down drastically, uh, you could incorporate that fact 
by looking at the higher order Greek. So if you know how delta would change with regards to volatility, the rate of change of delta with regards to volatility, that is also a Greek, the second higher order Greek, second order Greek, a higher order Greek. So you know that the moment the result comes out, the portfolio delta would go from being hedged to being massively short or from, from, for, or from being massively short to being massively long. So even that is possible. So you think that you, you have a, a short exposure to the market. You think that if the prices go down, that's good for you. But you have forgotten to account for the fact that post the announcement, the volatility is going to go, drop down drastically so that you, you would actually end up being long the market. That is also possible, right? So therefore, uh, account adjusting for changes in volatilities, you could uh, uh, quickly uh, uh, understand how your risks are, are going to look like. And uh, likewise, uh, so post uh, uh, the Fed chairman's announcement, the volatilities are going to go down. So you can see how your portfolio Vega will be, look like for uh, a scenario when the volatility has dropped down. So based on the future, so if you ask volatility to drop down 10%, all you need to do is uh, figure out how the second order Greek would uh, look like. And uh, uh, so using that, you can arrive at what the Vega would look like for a 10 percentage drop in uh, volatility. Yeah, any, any, any other questions? Well, Rajiv, I want to thank you very much for this entire series. And uh, for those of you who may have only picked up part one, part two, or just joined us for part three, I do want you to know that each of the other or the two um, coordinated events um, are also go are posted on the Interactive Broker site. I have been recording today's webinar and I will be sending each of you a direct link to today's recorded playback just in case you want to come back and review the concepts that Rajiv has discussed today. Also want you to be aware I'll include a link to those prior recordings as well. So with that, I want to thank Rajiv um, and the entire Quant Insti team for a ter tremendous series on options. Thank you so much. Uh, Gwarev is asking about the um, link to Excel. And Gwarev, I will be discussing that with Quant Insti. And um, actually, I'm going to ask that you do contact them to get a copy of that Excel spreadsheet. Um, uh, so you'll find at the end of today's session or at the end of the uh, slides, you'll find the contact information will be included there. So with that, we are going to conclude our series, our three-part series on managing um, <clears throat> option portfolios. And Rajiv, thank you so much for all the work that you've put into each of these presentations. We look forward to working with you further in 2018. And I see that you've got the slides that are up here as well. So. Um, by the way, everyone, we'll include a link to today's webinar notes um, as uh, along with today's recorded playback. So with that, we are going to conclude our session here today. I want to thank all of you for participating with uh, each of these events, and especially thank Quant Insti for making this series of events possible. So with that, uh, we're going to exit today's session, or you can exit today's session using the X that's included in the upper right-hand corner of your control panel. Thanks all very much for a terrific presentation, uh, and have a great rest of your day. Be on the lookout. I'll be sending out uh, the recording notes or the webinar notes and a link to today's recording uh, soon after the session ends. So thanks, everyone. Have a great rest of your day. Yeah.